This is our annual joint meeting with the Board of Education, so welcome to all of our guests um, and the Budget Committee. So most of you know, I know all of you in this room know, that when you add our operating costs along with what we pay in debt services, education is 75% of our overall budget. So that's part of the reason we did this meeting jointly and do it together just to expedite the conversation. This is a Health and Education Committee meeting. So when I call for a vote, there will only be Health and Education Committee members voting. As we're having conversation, I welcome questions from everyone, including school board members, budget members, um, any other commission members who are here. So it is an open discussion, open conversation, but we will not be accepting um, votes from anyone other than health and education. Um, I have, um, initially we excuse all the other departments from attending this meeting, but LaShan Dixon has recently received a promotion. She's gonna be leaving Rutherford County um, and going to, the, to a state position. So I have asked her to attend this meeting and give us her last health department report. So if you would, Ms. Dixon, please join us. Children, commissioners of this amazing committee and guests, good evening. I am LaShan Dixon and I have the pleasure of giving the last report as your public health county director for Rutherford County. I'm sincerely humbled and honored to give this presentation tonight and I thank Chairman Allen for this opportunity to present to you all tonight as it's been 14 amazing years that I have served here in Rutherford County with the Rutherford County Health Department. I first started off as a part-time employee working with a program called Tender Care, then moved my, and worked my way up into the health educator position, and then as the assistant public health director, and then finally as the public health director. So I'm very humbled and honored to stand here before you this evening. Taking a look at your report of April of 2022, our three columns labeled protect, promote, and improve continue to increase as we continue to provide services to all of our residents here in Rutherford County. This past month, we were able to do some phenomenal programs centered around mental health and mental health awareness and looking at suicide prevention as well within our health education outreach. Additionally, our clinical encounters continue to increase as we are seeing more patients in both of our health departments in both Murfreesboro and in Smyrna. We will continue to work with our telehealth partners to provide telehealth also to our residents for those individuals who do not feel comfortable coming back into the health department at this time. As we look at COVID-19, our numbers do tend to continue to decline um, based off of our national average as well. And so we're very fortunate to have that a little bit behind us as we're looking at the COVID-19 endemic. Friday, March the 13th, 2020, marked our first case of COVID-19 here in Rutherford County. And oh, how there will be a day that I will never forget, as it was also the day that we came in and we asked for help from each and every one of you all. Mayor Ketron and commissioners, you stepped up to the plate and you helped us in a time that we desperately needed it. We were able to work along with our school systems, thank you. Rutherford County Schools and Murfreesboro City Schools, as well as our local hospitals and churches to make sure that we can mitigate the spread of COVID-19 here in our county. And while we lost a lot of amazing individuals along the way, each and every one of us worked together and pulled together. I would not be the woman that I am today if it wasn't for the amazing individuals who I refer to as my village, my health department family and staff, as well as our community partners. Cody York, Chris Clark, all of our local fire, EMS, and law enforcement pulled together at a time of need. And we were able to get through this pandemic. And so I just wanna leave you all with this. I am proud to serve our residents here in Rutherford County, and even prouder to be able to take this and serve our great state of Tennessee. This is not a goodbye as I will still be working here in Rutherford County and working alongside with our Rutherford County Health Department to make sure that we have programs that are gonna be sustainable for years to come. 86,400 is a number that I first said when I first got the Rutherford County Health Department Director role. 
is the amount of seconds is found in each and every day. And I will continue to use that 86,400 each and every day to make an impact on the lives of others that will never be erased. Realizing that yesterday is already gone and that tomorrow is not promised, I will continue to live in the moment and be in the moment and serve our residents of Rutherford County and Tennessee on a statewide level. Thank you. So first we'll take care of the business of approving the report. Do I have a motion to approve the report? Madam Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve it. Thank you. Yes. Very good. And second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. Um, any commissioners that would like to make any comments, please do so now. I, I have some as well, but you're going to be in tears when I'm done, so you go first. <laughs> okay. All right, LaShan, I wrote these down so I wouldn't cry and I wouldn't forget. I'm not going to forget, but I still might cry. We have been blessed by your leadership during a remarkable time. Your professionalism under an extreme set of circumstances has just been remarkable and admirable. You have the biggest, most generous, genuine heart of any public servant I've ever had the opportunity of serving with. And so I just want you to know how grateful I am that you stood in the gap for all of us between the known and the unknown. And you helped us chart our way out of a very dark and scary time. And we can never sufficiently thank you for all that you did. You're always one to sh share all the credit with everyone else, but somebody had to lead. And you lost a dear friend and very unexpectedly had to move into that role. And you did it with grace and expertise and talent beyond measure. The highest compliment I give anybody, and I don't give it very often, is grit. And sister, you have grit. And I admire it so much, and we appreciate you. And the rest of the state is very blessed to have you join that larger team. And we appreciate you so much. Thank you. And then one last thing, so John Blair is your interim, is that correct? Yes. John Blair. John Blair will be serving as the interim um, director for this current term. They do plan on posting the position on June the 1st after uh, my official end date will be uh, May 31st, and so they will have the position posted. Um, I know last time, commissioners, you also asked in regards to Dr. Mack's position, the previous dental uh, doctor role that we have at the health department, and so they are currently looking at either having us having a doctor come in or a, a nurse practitioner and so that's something they'll be looking at um, over the course of the next couple of weeks as well thank you we appreciate you okay special project oh let me I skipped ahead um, we did not approve the minutes so I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes from our previous meeting Madam chairman I've read the minutes and make a motion that we accept them as submitted okay, thank you okay, thank you all in favor please say aye any opposed? Very good. Special projects. Do we have Ms. Jolly? We have Mark. Who do we have for special projects? Oh, there's Lisa. Okay. Yep. Yep. So we do have the special projects report. Lisa's available to answer any questions if you have any. If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. This is simply our routine for those who are watching, this is our routine um, business matter of just looking at the bills that have been paid um, as they've come in. So, Move to approve the special projects report, Madam Very Chairman. Good. Thank you. Second. Very good. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Very good. All right, school board, welcome. First, going to start off with a couple of amendments here. Uh, first of all, uh, amendment for fiscal year 21 22 general purpose uh, school fund 141. This budget amendment cleans up both revenue and expenditure items, line items at the end of the fiscal year as it approaches. 
On the revenue side, the budget is, amendment, uh, is amended to reflect actual year-to-date collections of state, BEP, IDEA high cost, and mixed drink tax. E-rate revenue is decreased to reflect the successful current year conversion of Rutherford County Schools from the E-rate bear application process to the service provider invoicing application process that the majority of the Tennessee County School Districts have already uh, transitioned to years ago. This newer type of E-rate application process will no longer require Rutherford County taxpayers to pay 100% of the upfront cost of the E-rate program and to seek reimbursement for 60%, thus saving the county in administrative work and money. On the expenditure side, the larger items of this cleanup amendment reflect the higher cost and demand of school maintenance supplies and parts in contracted, service, uh, contracted summer floor stripping and waxing due to sc school custodian staffing shortage. This amendment has a net increase of both current year revenue and expenditures of $3,027,341 which is less than 1% of the original expenditure budget for this fund and with no use of fund balance. Um, uh, I recommend approval of this amendment, Fund 141, to clean up revenue and expenditure line items and a net increase of $3,027,341 for both revenue and expenditure budget line items. All right, any questions regarding the motion? Move to approve. Second. Second. Very good. Thank you. Give us a roll call, please. Commissioner Cook. Yes. Commissioner Blair. Commissioner Key. Yes. Commissioner Gammon. Commissioner Gurley. Yes. Commissioner Phillips. Yes. Chairman Allen. Yes. All right, uh, number two is the uh, budget amendment for the fiscal year 21-22 uh, centralized cafeteria fund. The centralized cafeteria fund of fiscal year 21-22 amendment budgets for additional cafeteria salary expenses and food costs to support the Rutherford County summer learning camps as well as to provide temporary $3 per hour increase for hourly school nutrition department employees that work during the month of June of 2022 in order to cover the food service staffing needs for the Rutherford County Summer Learning Camps. This pay incentive recognizes the, the great need for adequate staffing for school nutrition operations during the month of June of 2022 and the fact that our 10-month hourly cafeteria, uh, cafeteria employees do not normally report to work to serve meals in the month of June. This funding for this one-time hourly increase will be provided by additional federal USDA seamless summer funding. Uh, a note to this is while not included in the current year budget amendment, it is requested that the board authorize this temporary $3 per hour increase for the school nutrition staff working during the month of July of 2022 for summer school and summer feeding programs. And this is budgeted expense will be included in our proposed 2022 school nutrition fund budget. Recommend to approve this fiscal year 21-22-143 budget amendment of 923528 to increase in both current year revenues and expenditures for additional costs for food service for the Rutherford County Schools learning camps and to authorize a $3, temporary $3 per hour increase to our food service uh, for the month of June of 2022 and July of 2022 and the Rutherford County Nutrition Department hourly employees in order to support the food service staffing needs in the, our camps. Cost for July of 2022 is a temporary pay increase will be included as we stated earlier in our 2022-2023 school nutrition fund budget. Any questions? I understand a motion. I move to approve. Might make a comment that this is not county money. It looks like it's federal money, so we can spend it. Commissioner Why? Phillips? Can you spend it wisely? <laughs> Commissioner Phillips? Yes. Mr. Gurley? Yes. Commissioner Key? Yes. Commissioner Cook? 
Yes. Chairman Allen. Yes. Motion passes. We're going to we're going to go through a couple things tonight as we before we dive right into the line items of these three budgets. Um, there's been a lot of questions about the new funding formula that will be coming out not this coming fiscal year for schools from the state, but for the fiscal year after that, 23-24 is when this new funding formula would take place. So, Mr. Spurlock's going to discuss quite a bit of that with you here in just the next couple minutes, and hopefully we can answer your questions. And at the end of the day, what everybody wants to know is what what is the impact for Rutherford County as far as additional revenue? We've this county, the county commission and school board for many years have been um, letting the state legislative body or the state general assembly know um, repeatedly that BEP funding is inadequate, especially for growing districts. And it appears that they have finally heard us. And um, it appears that we will be receiving some, some additional funding from the state. Before we jump into that, just give a couple of highlights here of what we've been doing financial management wise over at the uh, county schools this year. This will be our agenda for tonight. The first is we're going to discuss the financial highlights and accomplishments for the current fiscal year for Rutherford County Schools. The very first thing, Rutherford County School System earned an unqualified clean financial audit for the last fiscal year with zero documented financial management deficiencies. And that's with, um, besides just in the pandemic, but also with a great deal of federal project money, ESSER funds coming through that our, our office had to account for. We had a, we had mo we were monitored for that, and of course we came out with a clean uh, monitoring from the State Department of Education. I'm very proud of our financial management staff that we have over there. Um, obviously, if if you're in business, you know a good accountant can save you money. We ju I just found out today from the state that uh, State Department of Education that there's a lot of requirements for this federal money that we're getting. And they say, you make sure you dot the I's, cross the T's. Well, they, the state informed me today that there was a rural county not far from here that they didn't dot the I's and cross the T's with their financial management with this federal money. And they just recently are having to pay back $4 million of that money. And that's where the county with the property tax levy brings about 30,000 a penny. So it's not that you're, if you have good financial management, not only can help you with knowing where your money's being spent and where it's coming in, but it also will literally, with federal money, it will save you a great deal of money and having to repay things that were for unallowed expenses. So I'm very proud that our county school system received that. Go through these here before we go into, these are some of the, the highlights that we, we did, we accomplished this year. First thing we did was we updated our school activity fund software. And what that is is, we all know our, if you have a student in any school system, eventually they're going to do a fundraiser for, they're going to go on a field trip, they're going to raise money for something. Um, we have activity fund software at each of our schools, um, or the majority of our schools, the, the alternative schools do not have that. Um, but um, the majority of our schools have an activity fund. That activity fund, and once again you think fundraisers, that's not much money. Well, when you look at Rutherford County, the size of Rutherford County School, that's over $13 million last year that went through activity fund software. The software that we were using was from an early 1990s DOS-based software. We upgraded that to a cloud-based software system that has very robust internal controls over the students and parents' money. Um, it also allowed for ease of training new bookkeepers for those school activity funds at the school level. That said, we also launched the first formal onboarding training and a continued education program to increase retention and ability of our school level bookkeepers for these activity funds. Once again, the more they understand as those bookkeepers at those individual schools through the activity funds, that cuts down on waste, fraud, and abuse, and also make sure that that money is properly accounted for. 
We created a one-stop shop webpage for our school support organizations, our booster clubs, our PTOs, to assist with compliance with state and local financial and internal control requirements. Um, we, uh, a lot of the larger counties had already done that. We just replicated that by having that. So our parents and community support could just go to one place to get anything they needed to, uh, to comply with anything state and local as far as requirements for being a booster club. We followed the lead of the other county departments and initiated electronic timekeeping for all of our hourly non-exempt employees. We were able to successfully implement that this current fiscal year. It ended the use of paper timesheets. We literally had close to 2,000 people doing paper timesheets every two weeks that was coming up into the county payroll office eventually. It was a lot of paperwork, it was a lot of time, and sometimes it could be inaccurate. All that's gone now. We, are, we have caught up with the other county departments and several of the other larger systems in the area when we've implemented this electronic timekeeping. We also transitioned to the same budget software as the county finance department and other surrounding counties are using for uniformity and uh, budget reporting. And that's what you'll be seeing in front of you tonight, that software. Obviously, it looks different, the printouts, but if, once again, if as commissioners, you guys see this, this format in your other funds that Ms. Nolan and Mark give you. So those are some of the things that we've been doing over in Rutherford County Schools on f as far as the financial aspects, besides just the everyday purchasing and uh, financing and budgeting. And with that, I'm gonna let Mr. Spurlock talk about, he's gonna talk about the new funding formula that the state's gonna be bringing us here soon. You can punt it, you push it for me when I tell you to. Yes, sir. First of all, I'd like to just, uh, bring your, to your attention that we do know that Rutherford County Schools was the uh, number one uh, district with the highest ADM growth in the state of Tennessee this year, over 2,000 students. Um, quite frankly, there's only about 16 with any measurable amount of, of growth. Now, when we, when we look at uh, what we're talk, uh, talking about with the uh, BEP and the new TISA formula, go ahead and flip that, if you will. We know about BEP, we know the history of BEP. I'm sure, Senator, were you, uh, Mayor, were you in, down in Nashville in 92? Uh, you were still here. Okay. Here. When in 92 is when they took up the, you know, I think it was because of the rural counties that filed a lawsuit against the state of Tennessee. They took it up and created the BEP. Now, if you've looked at the BEP, it's got, I think, like 64 components. Yeah. And quite frankly, it's difficult to understand. <laughs> Uh, as we, you know, so, so we started out with BP. We had a little bump, what we called a little enhancement of the BP uh, in, in 2007. Then in two, uh, 2014, after a lot of consternation, people complaining, districts complaining about funding, uh, the, um, Governor Haslam convened a task force. They came up with some ideas, but some of them went, went away. Uh, 2016, once again, it was slightly modified, a little bit more money put in that uh, in the BEP, and which leads us where we are today. I think Doug will uh, testify, he's already said this. The biggest issue are our fastest growing counties. I mean, we're one of them. Uh, quite frankly, even with charters, we're gonna continue to grow. People like to be here. And it's, 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 uh, it's something when you look at the investment. So we'll go to the next uh, slide and look at some big takeaways. Uh, first of all, it says districts would receive more funding under TISA than they would under BEP, assuming they have a stable enrollment. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, that concerns me about rural counties. <coughs> if they don't have a stable, <coughs> Enrollment now, <laughs> who's to say they're gonna have a stable enrollment years to come? Local, the total local contribution does not increase for four years. In other words, the MOE, whatever it will be for this year, will be taken into next fiscal year and it will stay locked in for four years and in 2027, then it will pick back up again. Now, uh, a lot of that's gonna be predicated, what's that gonna look like? What is the ADM gonna look like over four years? We, we don't know that. Uh, if the general, you, you, we hear a lot of districts saying, well, what if they put the money into BP, what would it look like? 
Well, I can tell you what it would look like. It would look like uh, a, a large tax increase for these rural counties who can't make their MOE currently. So that's, that, that w that's not gonna help. Um, next slide, we're gonna look at the parts of the, uh, of the uh, actual formula here, the actual framework of the student-based formula. First of all, we start with the base, that's that layer down there. That's everything that we currently see in BP and then some. Uh, that's instructional, that's classroom, and that's non-classroom, materials, instructional materials, all those kind of things. In the state of Tennessee, and we'll look at it here in a minute, it's $6,860 per student. That's the second highest in the southeast, only Arkansas is higher than that, and it's the 12th highest in the nation. There's about 31 states that actually have a student-based uh, formula. So in the base, it covers everything that we talked about earlier. Then you have the weights. Now the weights provide additional funding determined by the unique learning needs of students. We'll talk about that later on. Then you have the direct funding. The direct funding is provided to give students opportunities to improve. This would be in literacy. This would be in our career and technical education classes. It'd be in a variety of different ways. And last but not least is the outcomes funding. In other words, what kind of progress are we making academically? Each student in, uh, will get funded for that. Next slide, please. Let's dig a little deeper into the base funding. When we look at what will go into the base funding, $6.6 .6 billion of, of additional money, quite frankly, if you look at that and you compare it to what will go in this year, you're looking at about $126 million more dollars just in the base. Okay, uh, what does it do? Well, how does it help us? First of all, it says it helps us, it can help us to recruit uh, teachers from out of state, recruit uh, workforce. You know, one of the things that we do know as they go along, if they're gonna add, in, if they're gonna add raises for teachers, it will go into the base. That's where it will, will go. Okay, next, and by the way, the base, how it works, the base is a 70-30. Of course, we know fiscal capacity comes into play. So for Rutherford County, and this is just state and local, for Rutherford County, we're talking about 59% from the state, 41% from the local. Okay, so let's go on to the weights. When we look at the weights, we're talking about, you know, students that have either from an economically disadvantaged or concentrated poverty. Now, concentrated poverty would be what we call our Title I schools, so which means uh, one of the good things about that, if, it's, if uh, you're a Title I school, uh, you know, currently when we're getting free and reduced lunch, we have to fill out forms. Once they are Title I school, everyone in that school eats free. English language learners, depending on what tier they are and the more money they will get. Special ed students, depending on the intensity of their, uh, their handicapping condition, will determine how much they get more. And yes, charter school facilities is in there, but thank goodness it was at one time in the base. Now what would be wrong with putting it in the base? Let me tell you what would be wrong. Every time they added more money into the base, it would increase the um, more money to the charter facilities. So they, they took it out of there. All right, moving on. This is a breakdown. This is the state of Tennessee, and this is a breakdown. It shows you breakdown by weights. Economically uh, disadvantaged students get 25% of that base. So they get the base and they get 25% of it. Students living in concentrated poverty, they get 5%. They get the base and 5% of the base. Now, students in sparsely populated communities, that's a, uh, uh, a 25 students or less within a square mile of the, L, uh, of the entire county. Students living in rural uh, school districts, those are less, 600 or less. 
they get an additional 5%. And then we have what's called unique learning needs. Now these unique learning needs, uh, there's a range of those things. And we'll kind of look at an example of, it, of what a student can generate. It's up to, it's from uh, uh, five to 15, or excuse me, 15 to 150%. So it can be quite, uh, quite large when we look at it. Direct funding, as we talked about before, direct funding, there's gonna be 145 million to enhance K-3 grade literacy. You know, that's the big, that's gonna be one of the big things, improving the number of students that are reading on grade level at third grade. Eight million, to offer tutoring for fourth graders who need more support, 210 million to support career and technical education, and then 13 million for, for, uh, for paying for ACT and also ACT uh, retakes. Now I will tell you all these things here come with a requirement. Guess what that requirement is? You better improve. You're gonna have to improve. All right, so that was our direct funding. Then we go to the, uh, breaking it down. You know, when we look at K-3 students, every one K-3 student would generate $500. When we're talking about a fourth grader receiving uh, tutoring, every one of them would receive $500. Strengthening and expanding the value of career technical education offerings, Every CTE student would be would generate five thousand dollars, and for the students who take uh, the post-secondary assessments, they would generate one hundred eighty-five dollars per student. And then we have the outcomes. You know, the outcomes are basically how did well did the students do? You know, that, that is awarded those that, for example, the more you have that are reading on grade level, each one of those students will generate some funding. The same thing with our high school students, with our career and technical education, those that are receiving uh, certifications, and quite frankly, the higher the certification you get, the more funding you will receive. Now, I say all that because we actually have an estimate, and I, th I don't think well, let's look at this first. This is kind of interesting here. Uh, you got an elementary student, and you can see through the elementary student there, you know, one, you know, we got the base, uh, we've got the other areas, generates that amount. Now look over to your right. That, element, that uh, elementary student, maybe in that same school, generates $15,592. So the, the more, and quite frankly, this is not about generating funding, this is about generating funding that assists these students for being, in being successful. All right, the next would be a middle school. As you can see the example there, the same thing, pretty close right there. Now there was a question I think early on back in, in uh, Mr. Gurley, uh, Commissioner Gurley, I think you may have asked that question, what would keep uh, them from over identifying students in special ed and stuff like that because you have a lot of paperwork uh, to do and you also have some oversight okay and then high school as you can see once again in high school this this is uh, all the things that they that this the student qualifies for they get 17,847 there has been some I've, I've seen up to 22,000, okay? All right, this is where we, we, we actually dis, dis, disregard this. You can look at it, but we actually have our projected, let me see if I got it here, you got it with you? We actually have our projected projection, and, and we took our own numbers you know, we took our own numbers because that's the way you're supposed to do. We start off at the top. The projection, what, what the state did was give us a projection of what they thought our ADM would be in 23, 24. Now this does not mean this will be here. In fact, I'm gonna be honest with you, it may be a little higher. But currently it says 49,729.45. That would generate, uh, generate a base funding from state and local of 416,026,451. All 
All right, economically disadvantaged. Projection, we will have 9,817.02 in 23, 24. Now that's just a projection estimate. That would generate 16,836,189.30. Concentrated poverty, 18,570.64. That would generate $6,369,729.52. Then we go on down to our yield ends because we don't have small and sparse. Now we will have charter, but currently we don't have one active, so we'll, we'll see then. All right, the yield end, 15% uh, of the base. We have 2,044.83. That would generate $2 104,130.07. ULN 2, that's a 20%. We have 4,000, projected 4,414.73. That would generate 6,057,009.56. Uh, ULN 4, and as you notice, if we're going down the weights, they're getting more uh, larger. That's because of the intensity. ULN 4, we have a projected enrollment or ADM of 1.06. That would generate $4,362.96. ULN uh, 5, projection of 3,662.10. That would generate $17,508,404.20. ULN 6, 679. Uh, that would generate $3,493,455. ULN 8, that's 17.32. That would generate uh, $118,815.20. And ULN 9, 125%. We have estimated 729.54 ADM. That would generate $6,255,805.50. And the ULN 10, 11.57. And that would generate $119,055.30. Now we look at our direct funding, we get an additional for these 11,771.91 ADM for K3 literacy. We get an additional five million eight hundred eighty-five thousand nine hundred and fifty-five, uh, eight hundred and eighty-five thousand nine hundred fifty-five. Fourth grade, we get an additional uh, for eighteen hundred and one point five of those. We get a, an additional nine hundred thousand six hundred twenty-five dollars. CTE, two thousand seven hundred seventy-eight point one six ADM. That would generate thirteen million eight hundred ninety thousand eight hundred dollars. Post-secondary ACT, uh, 4,383.45. That would generate 812,428.62. The grand total for this estimate of both, uh, our, both our state and local, 504,677,069.35. Now that is by student. Now, how will, that, how, how will that occur? Unlike currently, where we have to wait for our growth, we will get that in our first month. We'll, in fact, we'll get it, uh, we'll, get, we'll be reconcile our, our ADM and we'll be funded for 10 months in a row. Now, there are some things in here, like for example, outcomes that we don't really know now. There's a lot of things we don't know there. Uh, the point being is, once again, on the base where the local comes in, that will actually be frozen for four years until the fifth year in which it kicks back in again. Any questions? It's a huge investment, but let me explain to you. This money is student allocated. If the student leaves, guess where the money goes? It goes with the student. Now there are currently a lot of flexibility, but I can tell you from the conversations that I've had that there's going to be some additional, um, I guess, additional checks and balances. And I think they need, need to be when you're talking about this kind of investment. 
there's going to be some additional checks and balances that will be placed into the law. Anything? All right, Doug. Okay. Unless anybody's got any questions on this, this portion we'll go into the uh, first of the three funds. Has anybody got any questions on this funding formula? Obviously, the State Department of Revenue will be uh, putting together the guidelines, you know, over the next 12 months. So we'll get more information, of course, bring it on to you. It's just like Mr. Perlock said, we're, we will be able to re recognize, sh you know, if the Gen General Assembly holds true to this promise, um, next year with their budget, then uh, we should be able to see some additional state funding coming to Rutherford County Schools in 23-24. Obviously, we're talking about the, fund, the budget tonight for 22-23, but just to know on the horizon, there's money, some additional state money coming. Um, one thing to note that in the uh, bill that went into, into it that, that funded TISA, um, they had a, a, a bullet in there that said if the State General Assembly did not fully fund this, then of course it, we would just stay with BEP. So there was an out for the General Assembly, and I'm sure they were thinking the same as everyone else is what happens if the economy crashed. So um, we're wary of that, but I believe that they are going to fund this based on the conversations they've had. Okay. Excuse me. If we turn to fund 143, it'll be our first fund that we're going to look at tonight. And this is the centralized cafeteria fund. Just the highlights of this fund. This is there are currently 50 schools that serve our students, with five of those schools being a satellite feeding site or another school with a full kitchen. Our 50th school um, was a, well, Plainview's our 50th school now. It was the one before that was the virtual school. Um, even at the virtual school. We serve um, breakfast and lunch, and that's not a virtual lunch, it's an actual lunch, but um, we actually do have students at our virtual school come, and, come, in, to, come in for some tutor and some help, so we, we offer food to those students should they choose to participate in our feeding program. If you recall, a couple years ago, we centralized our food service staffing. This was the same that every other Middle Tennessee school system had already done. This has paid large dividends to the cafeteria staff. When I say centralized food service, basically in the past we had it where we were literally using silos for our school cafeterias. You know, if you were at this middle school, you reported this middle school. If you're at this elementary school as a food service um, employee, you reported that one. We replicated the best practice and um, we replicated best practice and just said, okay, we're going to centralize the staffing for these, uh, these cafeterias system wide. That way, if you are a, typically you're working at uh, Blackman Elementary, let's say example, in their cafeteria, if um, they are okay for the day with staffing, let's say Blackman Middle right next door to that is needing additional staffing for the day, that those additional employees could be moved just down the street to help Blackman Middle instead of Blackman Middle struggling to serve the students that they have there. This has paid off in great dividends, also not just with doing that with the staffing, but also staffing based on a national best practice, which is meals per labor hour served. Instead of saying, okay, well, I, it seems everyone's busy, let's hire another person. We actually staff based on a national benchmark for food service in, um, in public school cafeterias on the meal per labor hour served. This is very similar to what uh, for-profit uh, food, food service agencies or industry would do, is based on the production, you hire more people. If um, we've been able to then adjust not off layoffs, but just through attrition to right size our cafeteria staff. We now have less staff than we had um, before the pandemic hit, but we're serving a lot more meals. Mr. Bedry, can I ask you a question? I know we're having a similar issue with filling custodian positions. Would that same logic apply 
to custodians or is that more unique where they need to be school specific? That's, this has been, that has been discussed by the board. Um, a lot of county school systems do centralize their custodial staffing, and that's been something I do know this, the Board of Education has discussed um, um, already about that, so that could be an option. One thing that we've done already over at, our, uh, at the school system, we've, uh, we hired a, it's called a centralized custodian coordinator. And what that is is we have this gentleman, he is a system-wide coordinator. He's, um, he used to have his own custodian, uh, custodial contract business. He also is one of our lead custodians years ago. He actually, um, well, one example of what he's doing right now is we do summer cleaning, and that's the floor stripping and waxing of all of our schools, and just the general deep clean while the children are out. Um, that custodian coordinator is actually over that. I mean, he, you have a lead custodian at each of the schools, but that coordinator is making sure, okay, I have manpower over here, I can shift. They need supplies over here, I can move the supplies. That way, we're not, we're not having one school with a large excess of supplies, <coughs> while this one over here is ordering more, instead of just saying, hey, we can go get that floor stripper wax from this school that's got extra. That cuts down on. So yes, I mean, that's something that is, look, is being looked at. This proposed budget funds a 5% pay increase for all of our full and part-time hardworking employees. And the last note is the seamless summer option is, and, and what that is, is that's the, US, the current USDA program that's been in effect for over two and a half years that every child in, in our school system uh, regardless of their parents' income, the, the USDA came in during the beginning of the pandemic and said, everyone will eat for no charge to the student. That has gone on for two and a half years, and according to the USDA, they are saying that, will, that program will sunset at the end of this summer, so when our children come back into our schools this fall, um, we will go back to traditional meal reimbursement in the fall semester. That meaning, of course, the, the, the normal, the, the, the traditional free and reduced for those that qualify, and if you don't, then of course you pay full meal price for your breakfast or lunch. Yeah, Knox County made an uh, announcement this morning. We will be making an announcement this week also. I think we need to get our parents ready for that and we'll be discussing this with the principals of their schools. They can put this on their web page uh, because this can, uh, you know, it's been a long time since everyone was paying, so uh, we want to make sure everyone is not hit with I got you kind of thing. Okay. okay. Move into the line items for that, for that budget. If you, and I sent this on to your, uh, the SharePoint, right behind the highlights is of course your detailed budget for Fund 143. Some of the major items that you see um, on the revenue side of the detailed budget, if you're looking, of course, I'm looking under the mayor board recommendation. Of course, that's, this is what the Board of Education voted on and approved for this budget and is required. Um, is if you notice in the board recommended line or column, you have budgeted revenue, bottom line $24,710,000. If you notice, there's no local funding in this budget, this cafeteria fund budget. You have just the meal charges for the students. You also have meal charges for the adults, um, a little bit of investment income, a la carte sales, and then going down below, if you notice, you'll see starting in revenue line 46520, a school food service, and the USDA lunch program right below that, you actually see revenue line items. Um, for example, the USDA school lunch program, that's the traditional you know, school reimbursement for free and reduced for lunches is $12 million budgeted. If you notice, if you go three columns over to the current fiscal year, next to that $12 million, there's a goose egg. And of course, once again, that's because we're having that seamless summer program, which is showing 
down below in 47114, the USDA other, the 16,878,614, that's the seamless summer funding to date for this fiscal year. As you can see, going into this next fiscal year, that's sunsetting. We have a small uh, USDA grant of like a quarter mil that we'll be budgeting for. But once again, going back to the traditional way of reimbursement for free and reduce and then full price for the meals. So that is the big di difference on the revenue side. Now, we'll be getting into this on the, on the GPS fund, but if you, got, if you folks recall, um, before the pandemic, and this had been going on for years, um, we have a policy at Rutherford County Schools that no child, even if they don't have money, if they have no money, they're going to get fed. If they're at school, you know, it's like, I think Mr. Jo Jeff Jordan said, a hungry child will not learn. That's right. So regardless of that child has forgot his lunch money or the parent, you know, the parent didn't give it to him, they're gonna get something to eat. And then we, we go and ask the parent to reimburse us later. Some parents are very good. Some parents forget to reimburse. We, in the year 2020, when we shut down schools back in the spring of, with COVID, we were on target to have $300,000 of bad meal debt that year. I have in the general purpose school fund budget for next fiscal year, I've budgeted half a million dollars for bad meal debt. The school board in 2020 created an ad hoc committee to study this, this bad meal debt. What we realized was over half of the bad meal debt in a school system at the time, a little under 46,000 students, over half the meal debt was concentrated with just under 500 students. And they were full price. So we, we realized there's things we can target to make sure we don't have these large meal debts once we go back to traditional. So we'll, we'll discuss that more next year because obviously the board is gonna be looking at that with, with different changes to their policies to keep that meal debt, bad meal debt down to a minimum. Anybody have any questions on the revenue side? On the expenditure side, the next, the next page, as you can see, just um, there's very modest increases in the payroll lines for um, the, um, you know, the 5% pay increase. We also, if you notice on our medical insurance line item, I held it the same as it was this current year, and the reason being is, as you know, that we're transitioning the state of Tennessee health plans beginning January 1, 2023. There's been discussion of this, you know, as Mercer, the county's risk uh, risk consultant, the former risk consultant, um, and um, and uh, broker had noticed had noted is there could be up to $7 million in savings for the BOE for moving to the state health plans if every single employee stayed in the exact same uh, current plan selection. You know, they stayed with the high deductible if they're in a high deductible now. They stayed with a regular copay, you know, or PPO if they're in a regular PPO. They did not enhance, but with the state having additional selections and a lower cost, we could obviously see migration of our employees to, even though it would be, it would be cheaper for them, it would be, of course, it would pick up some money, um, additional cost to the county. So we budgeted this with the mindset until we can see that first year of enrollment of our employees, we don't want to decrease those medical line items until we can see, you know, after that first year of enrollment where we stand. But I, I, I believe looking at different scenarios that we're gonna see some, some savings there. But for the sake of being conservative, we're gonna just hold those lines where they're at for one year. One other item that of note, if you drop down to the food supplies, if you notice that 73, 100, 422, the increase, we currently have an amended budget for food supplies, that's just your raw food supplies that our cooks prepare the meals with. Currently, this fiscal year, we have an amended budget of 7,700,000. 
We are increasing that budget for food to $11 million next year, and that's due to we have and we've made our but we've kept our board aware of this as we went through the year. We have seen literally weekly, if not sometimes every other day, price increases from our food suppliers, our vendors. Um, we've actually just like others we have had to scramble thankfully we are such a large district our vendors have kept us supplied some of the smaller districts have actually had issues even getting food so in the quantity so we we serve on a given day it's close to 40,000 meals that we serve in Rutherford County Schools to our our students so this is a huge school operate or a food operation that we're dealing with. And I believe the rest of this, and like I said, the, the, the non-food and supplies of course have gone up due to price increases. That leaves a final expenditure budget, bottom line 27 million, 270,574, which of course is a budgeted deficit However, we have a we have due to the changes in how we um, are managing this operation and the USDA funding, we have uh, occurred a um, accumulated a very good fund balance. The federal government does not allow us to keep more than three months of operating expenditures in this cafeteria fund. Um, their thought is, if you're accruing this money up, if you're accumulating, you need to put that back into the food service operation to have better food, to have better equipment. And of course, that's what we've been doing. We've been requesting to the board and this commission to let us go ahead and start replacing out stoves, um, dishwashers, other things that were failing and needing um, to be fixed. We also are gonna maintain some of that fund balance for when we go into next fall. We're gonna have before the board Thursday night, a preliminary price increase for our meals for next year. That'll be the first price increase in three years. Three years. So, I mean, it's, and it's really, when you think about that, if you were a freshman when the pandemic hit, you're gonna be a, a senior before you pay for a meal yeah. in, a school, in a public school system. And that's not just here, that's in the United States. Um, so there will be some changes. We are going to have that preliminary price increase low as much as possible so we can just gauge participation, you know, student participation in the meal program before we revisit that. Of course, if it shows we should have raised it more the first at the beginning, we have that fund balance to fall back on. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions on the nutrition fund? I have, I have one. The 40,000 meals a day that you quoted, is that breakfast and lunch combined? That's correct, yes sir. Thank you. Mr. Gooch. Um, I'm not quite understanding line 469. Could you just explain that for a second or two? That's the USA com, uh, good question. It's. The USDA commodities, what that is, is that it'll be like a whole, we'll just talk about chicken. <laughs> we get whole chickens and the commodities, that's what we get. We get the commodities and it's just an in and out. We process those up and that's so we can show, hey, we, we got, we received this much in. We have a vendor that then processes up these big bulk meat items, chickens, into, you know, just strips. And that, and that accounts for that right there. So it's just an in and out. It's an in and out with the commodities. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Continue. Oh, yes, Commissioner Phillips. This is not a recommendation. It's a point. A couple of years ago, we talked about potential of food services being contracted and uh, you said that it's a possibility that other districts were doing that and you were going to look into that to see how that worked and uh, maybe explore the potential for that happening to Rutherford County. And I know the pandemic probably put all that on hold, uh, but is that something that's still on? I think with a shortage of, of, of workers that it may be something that will, you know, this, we were very fortunate that prior to all this, a pandemic occurring 
that we centralized the cafeteria and it allowed the director to move people from here to there. But it, it's obvious something that as you grow as a large system as we are, uh, it's something that you have to look at. But that would be to the, at the, at the board's purview though. You want to do these? Separately? Oh, yeah, we can do these separately. Sure. All right. If there's no questions, we'll entertain a motion on Fund 143. Motion would be the centralized cafeteria fund 143-2022-23 budget has 24 million 710 thousand in revenues, 27 million 362 574 in expenditures, and uses 2 million 652. 1,574 of fund balance to fund the cafeterias. Recommended motion to approve the centralized cafeteria fund, fund 143, 22, 23 budget as presented. Move to approve the request and forward to budget with a positive recommendation. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Can you call the roll for us? Commissioner Cook. Commissioner Key, he stepped out. He stepped out. Commissioner Gurley, yes. Commissioner Phillips, yes. Chairman Allen, yes. Okay. Before we go on to the next fund, which is capital projects, then we get into the into the GPS. Um, in your packet, you have, and some of the commissioners may have already seen this. This Miss Nolan had prepared what the property tax levy and the penny on the property tax brings, and I have that in your packet tonight. Will be discussed, and this play, this works into the conversation with the next next fund, next two funds. So, with as you can see, with uh, the new reappraisal has been done, and the state has sent the the new certified tax rate. Unofficial. Unofficial. Thank you. <laughs> Unofficial. We'll use that. Um. Everybody, see where I'm at. Okay. Like I said, it's in your it's in your packet. Um, okay, as you see, the you have we have the current tax rate, which is two point two one nine four for this current year. Then we have the unofficial <laughs> um, new rate. Well, it's, you know, it's hopefully, well, we'll, well, unofficial new certified rate. Um, if, if what's interesting is you see how far that dropped. It went from a 2.2194 to a 1.6158. Obviously, you know, when, when you go through a reappraisal, if the assessed values go up, then the certified rate would go down as state law says, you know, it has to be as much as possible a revenue neutral event. Um, there could be a huge discussion on that statement right there, you know, with many people, but that is the, you know, the, the, the goal of that is to move that down. Uh, Ms. Nolan had showed us that uh, she had the certified rate going back to, was it 94, 96? That she, 96. And what was so interesting, um, it's, well, it's interesting to me. But 19, 1977, <laughs> you had to go back to 1977 for the school portion of it to be under $2. Yes, we, we actually have, even as the county has grown with each reappraisal, of course, that rate would keep coming down and that, that just reflects the growth of Rutherford County, tremendous growth. Um, and people just moving in and companies building here. But what's interesting is like Mr. Spurlock said, we, would, we had to go all the way back to a 1977 uh, school budget, well, uh, the county's budget, and we looked at the certified rate back in 1977, it was still higher back then than it is now. And that's with the county a whole lot, and none of this going on. It was, it was still, it was about a dollar 80 or 90, something, something like that. that. But so this, this just attests to how rapid our county is growing. Dropping down, you can see at the bottom, and this is for the discussion here for tonight with the budget, the revenue per added penny with this unofficial preliminary estimate. 
in the unshared funds, you know, the county general fund, solid waste, the educational capital projects, a penny in educational capital projects, which we're going to discuss next, generates $1,431,814. A penny in the general purpose school fund, because we have, City of Murfreesboro has a city school system, we have to share that penny, penny based on their attendance, you know, a weighted average of their attendance. That means we share 14.75% of what a penny brings with the city of Murfreesboro for county property tax. So you can see a penny in the general purpose school fund, unofficial, unofficial generates 1,220,621. So you're seeing that drop as you go into placing a levy in the general purpose school fund. If you go to the left a little bit, you can see what that means in total dollars with the current rate that's the unofficial projected rate for the new certified rate. The city of Murfreesboro schools would receive $16,103,433 of county property tax because of the law saying, because they have that city school system, we, we move that over um, to them and share. Point being is obviously a penny in an unshared fund generates more. Okay, with that we move into 177. 177 fund is the Educational Capital Projects Fund. This was established by this commission several years ago. This was, I actually saw this with my previous job seat. This is like a best practice in a lot of counties that they understand there's items that, you know, it doesn't meet quite debt. You know, you, you, you'd see stuff that people were, counties were getting short-term loans for and paying the interest. And then the discussion is why did we not just set a property tax levy aside in the capital project fund and just pay cash for these things instead of paying interest? Because there was, you, and I'm sure that it was probably like that years ago, you'd see just loans on things that were just short-term loans. Um, so this is the best practice to have this educational capital project fund. Currently, where there is projected to be four cents but with the unofficial new certified tax rate in Fund 177. What we're gonna be requesting tonight is a shift of seven cents from the general purpose school fund, which we'll discuss that in detail next, to this Fund 177 for a total of 11 cents on the county property tax levy along with about budgeted two, two million four hundred fifty thousand inadequate facility taxes that are there now. Obviously the county commission went to the new by general law development tax that has to be spent for education debt service or capital projects only. Um, the first budget estimate for the fiscal year 22-23, I'm sorry, with being able to move, if you move over to the detailed for this fund, by moving those seven cents over from the general purpose school fund to the capital projects fund, that would increase and allow for over 10 about 10 million more dollars in capital projects to be utilized this coming fiscal year. Um, it would also reduce the amount that would have been sent over to the city schools by just under 1.5 million based on the search. So the point being, and we discussed this with our board tonight, Mr. Lee's gonna talk about here in a minute about what we would utilize this additional funds for if, uh, if this commission, the funding body decided to allow this. Um, we had a issue a couple years ago, and we talked about this with the Board of Education last night, we had an issue a couple years ago, we had a very large HVAC issue, a failure at Blackman High School, it was an emergency purchase, it cost a lot of money. Um, we of course had not budgeted for that, it failed, and we used funds from General Purpose School Fund, the shared penny that had already been shared. We have several large HVAC projects that are desperately needed. This would allow us to utilize an unshared penny, so we'd have $1.5 more million to 
on top of this to get the whole penny to address those critical issues before they fail. We talked about this is very similar to like when you come into your house in June and you, it feels warm and you know you have a serious AC issue. You can ignore it, but when July and August comes, you know what's going to happen. So this is this may be the opportunity this year that we can address those things before they become an emergency purchase. And Mr. Lee, if you'd like to come up and just discuss, once again, if you see on the second page of this, the, the we'll have a total, if the board, if the county commission approves this, we'll have a total of just under 18 million of new projects that Mr. Lee's folks will tackle this year for backlogged uh, maintenance. And that along with any of the carryovers, we would be probably looking at $20 million of projects that count school engineering would be working with to try to catch up. Mr. Lee can talk about the backlog and what he would get if we could do it. Two quick things, <clears throat> and I know there's a lot of numbers to look at. You, this body, along with the board's already seen this, the original. So what you have on tonight is uh, the first column is the 141 that totals 7,909,810. That's what we showed you a couple of months back when we came through for the original request. With this request tonight, we would be receiving an additional $10 million, so I want to highlight the, what we would spend that $10 million on. Basically, the, the lion's share of that gets gobbled up in two projects, Rockville Elementary and Stewartsboro Elementary. We would spend $8.5 million at those two schools renovating the HVAC. That's our two worst schools at this time. We would also spend uh, roughly 450000 at Laverne High, a couple hundred thousand at Oakland, and we would recommend spending 800000 at uh, Walter Hill on their roof. So basically, of the $10 million, I'm going to spend 9.2 of it in HVAC projects, and that's basically two large projects and a small area in two schools with $10 million. As we go forward, uh, unfortunately, like Mr. Beaudry has said, <coughs> we're seeing astronomical price increases on everything we touch. Um, and I don't expect these numbers to go down. Um, so uh, these projects that are $4 million this year were about two and a half last year. Uh, they're 4 million this year. And that's based on current estimates. Of course, we'll have to complete the design, put it out for bid, and then find out what the actual bids are. But that's what our budgets are at this time. Any questions for Mr. Lee? Commissioner? I have one question. The, the one thing that I kind of had a little, have a little issue with, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the development, schools facilities development tax can be used, can be used for schools facilities, such as we're talking about right now. But there are other areas that this type of tax can only be used is only available to spend in the general fund that other types of taxes cannot be spent in the general out of in the general fund such as fire right now uh, we've we've not gone the way of implementing a fire tax so i'm a, a little bit leery of of taking as much as we're taking out of the development tax and putting it in here uh uh, I don't know where, can, maybe our finance director can enlighten us as to where we might stand on that. Uh, what I don't want to see is because we as commissioners have to look at things other than the schools. And uh, so I'm not currently immediately aware of how tight we are in that area. And if we, you know, dropped a million off of this, would we, put our says are we in good shape right now actually if you look we've reduced the our estimate in this fund we had um in the current year three million dollars for the school facilities tax and we're reducing it so i think we're being conservative two million four hundred fifty for next year so the three million was in the estimated estimate for the, current, the year. current year and we're only spending going to estimate actually spending 1.5 no well that's the revenue and i'm not um, sure okay. if this has been updated 
mean, I think, actually, I thought we would be um, below, but we may hit our estimate. I mean, we're going to be below what we got last year. What I want to know, you're telling me we're good. I don't think we're at that. Well, we're hedging it too. Two million four fifty. Now, the other half of this adequate facilities tax is in the debt service fund. I didn't mean to throw you, but I mean there's there's two parts to this. Right. So if we allocate what's being requested, approve what's being requested, we're not going to put ourselves in a bind. I do not think so. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Mr. Gooch. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on the um, first column, 2022-23, what, what's, what's the shaded area mean? Shaded area, it, it probably shows better on your iPads, green and yellow. The shaded area is what you've already seen is 141. That's what we presented a month or so ago, mid-April. The next column over is what the additional $10 million is. So you have two columns. The shaded area, if you look at the third page at the very bottom, is 7,909,810. That's what we showed you in April as our 141 project. Next to it is $10 million. That's this additional $10 million that we're proposing to move the money over for, and that, that, that's, what, how we, that's what those line items are. Does that make sense to you now? The 7-9 you've already seen, the $10 million you haven't. So that's the 10, so the yes. shaded area is the? 7 million nine oh nine. I mean, from the new. No, sir. That's what we should. That's what the uh, I used to call it, Dr. Bullen's nickel. <laughs> that's the money that we normally ask for. That's the seven million nine oh nine that we showed you in April. Okay. And the ten, the other items are the next column over. It's page 39, if you want to look at it on your iPad. So this is what we're doing this year? That's what we're asking you to do in addition to what we showed you. And so what's the, so the total is about 18 yes, million. Yes, Mr. Lee, will you go to the microphone, please? And then Commissioner Gooch, um, it's page 39 on your iPad, if it will help you see it in the shaded area better. And then, I'm sorry, Mr. Lee, if you'll just repeat for the audience, what you said. I walked away. Thank you. All right, so the green is the 141, which is what we, I call it the normal money that we've always come in here and discussed and we get to the nickel. So that's the green, we presented that in April. In yellow is the additional funding that Doug is proposing to move over is $10 million, so that column is to show you what we would spend that $10 million on. That, that assigns those projects to that $10 million. Okay, just one more question. What does the figure $53,882,000 represent? 53? Is it, uh, it says total. I have to look at your sheet to see which one. That wishes. Ninety nine. No, that's that's year one. This is a five. Let me go back to the mark. Thank you. This is a five year look ahead. This is five years. The, we used to do the, the very first one of these I brought y'all was one year. It was about twenty five million. That was three years ago. Last year it was up to about one hundred twenty five million, and we did a three year look ahead. The board asked me to look out five years for capital projects expenditures. So if you look at the bottom line, it's year 22-23, I'm saying $53,882,000 is what we need this year to get all of these projects complete. We're not going to. Now, okay, that's a weird I understand like that we don't. Wish list. 
It, it's a wish, okay. okay. A wish. It's a need. Well, how about that? Wish, need. We can agree to that. Yeah. Right. Either one. That's what that is. The next year's forty-two million. That would be our next year. That's wish, need. And you add it all together, it's one hundred ninety-nine million three hundred forty-one thousand dollars over five years. But each year we go back with the available funds. Commissioner Phillips and I had this conversation a couple of years ago. You're going to tell me how much money I can get, and I'm going to spend it the best way I can. And that's what the green and the yellow is. Thank you. I, uh, that's yes, sir. Better understanding now. Yes. Commissioner uh, Gurley? I, I said this back a couple of years ago when we talked about doubling the amount of money we put in the capital maintenance fund. We get a lot of, there's a lot of publicity, a lot of hype. When we spend $100 million building a new school building, you know, you go out here and you build a new $400,000 house, that's just the beginning of that. You've got to maintain that house. You've got to maintain that school. If you let it go too long, you know, a small replacement here and there can stave off a large expenditure. And what we've been doing over the years, and that's the reason we doubled that amount going into that fund a couple of years ago, is we were putting, keep putting these things off, putting these things off till we had crisis like Blackman and so on. We all know that the cost of maintenance and the cost of building, repair, and so on is going up astronomically. So if, if we can, if we can afford this, then it makes sense to me to go ahead and get a handle on some of it, get a hold of some of these things that are really going to come back to haunt us a year or so down the road at two or three times the cost. I won't be here. I won't have to worry about it. Mr. Spurlock won't be here. He won't have to worry about it. But somebody's got to worry about it, and that's going to be the commissioners and school board members, et cetera. And you know who's really going to have to worry about it? The taxpayers of Rutherford County. So uh, I think it makes good sense. I have one, I'm sorry, I have one follow-up question for Mr. Lee. Correct me if I'm wrong, on these large HVAC pieces of equipment, it's my understanding that many times these are not built until they're ordered. So you need significant lead time on placing orders for these. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, and that's one of the concerns that I have is that if something fails, we're not going to have lead time. Yeah, and in, in the Blackman example, fortunately, construction was not where it was. We weren't in the economy that we're in right now. There's portable chillers or tractor trailer trucks and you can bring them in and actually take over, and it was about half of Blackman. We took over half the building with a portable chiller. Well, that portable chiller is $10,000 a month plus fuel. And that chiller component that we needed, they don't sit on a shelf. You're right, they're custom built. So it took six weeks to get it even in the pipeline, then it's another month to get it made then once we get it here it's two months to get it installed you got a half a school year's gone so and it's even more now everybody's aware that the chip components and all the problems everybody's having getting parts and pieces most of your HVAC equipment has got electrical components in it so the answer to your question is yes, yes. it does Great. thank you any other questions Did we have a motion on 177? No. Okay. I'll entertain a motion on fund 177. If there's no questions. You want me to read the motion? Yeah, read the motion for us, please. Okay. And I want to stress this to people listening. This is not requesting a property tax increase. This is just shifting some pennies from one fund to the other to attack these, you know, these these critical needed infrastructure improvements. So the motion goes, Education Capital Projects Fund, Fund 177, Fiscal Year 22-23. Budget has $18,473,258 in estimated revenues and $18,473,258 in estimated expenditures. 
The requested property tax levy is 11 cents with 2,450,000 in county adequate facility tax. And this is adequate to fund the identified priority capital improvements in this proposed budget. Recommended motion is to approve the 22-23 the fiscal year capital project fund 177 budget as presented. I shall move. Thank you. We need a second. Call the roll force. Commissioner Key? Yes. Commissioner Phillips? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Gurley? Yes. Chairman Allen? Yes. Thank you. Moving on to our general purpose school fund. Our general purpose school fund, we have a proposed budget that has $462,670,815 in revenue, and that is after the seven cents that we just discussed was moved. It has $491,473,674 in expenditures, and has a budgeted ending assigned unassigned fund balance of $36,000,000. $479,941. If you notice on your first page that I've placed in your SharePoint for the General Purpose School Fund, I've placed a just a one-page summary for you on the financial operations of this fund. So you can see just on a one-page summary what this proposed budget would do. We are estimating a July 1, 2022, and end of this fiscal year, beginning um, assigned, unassigned, which is, of course, funding available to balance a budget. We're going to start the fiscal year, at least at this moment, we're estimating a fund balance, ending fund balance for this fiscal year of $65,000. $282,800, and of course, speaking with Lisa Nolan, of course, this is, this happens every year. You know, as we end the year and we do the, just the hard close of the books, that's when we realize, you know, we didn't spend every dime, and we brought in additional revenue on some line items on the revenue, so that, of course, would increase that number right there, that beginning number. And, Ms. Nolan, I'm, I'm, I'm safe to say this is going to be higher, be higher, okay. Um, but once again, we budget conservative. Estimated revenue for this budget, like I said, 462670815 with the pennies moved to capital projects. Estimated expenditures right there, 491473674 dollars leaving us with an estimated June 30th, 2023, assigned, unassigned ending fund balance, $36,479,941 at year end for 22-23. That percentage of assigned, unassigned ending fund balance to annual expenditures leaves us with a projected Ending fund balance, if we brought in every dollar and spent every dollar on this budget, we would wind up with a ending fund balance percentage of 7.42%, well above what the state requires for minimum. That has a budget deficit of $28,802,859, which is the note below. Um, Thought I, that's it's it's basically a six percent of total annual expenditures. That's what that deficit is. Six percent. Um, it's amazing that we've gotten this size in Rutherford County. But of course, like we've discussed, as this was pointed out right here, Rutherford County. Mr. Spurlock had talked about Rutherford County was not only we had not only had two over two thousand new students. We were the fastest growing school system. We had the most growth of any county school system in the state of Tennessee for 95 counties. Another note on that, if you notice, we, we actually, I pulled all the April BEP estimates for every county school system in the state of Tennessee. 
Um, we actually had 30, what was that 39 at the bottom? 39 Tennessee County school systems actually shrank in population. Of course, we've talked about the rural districts, but what's shocking is the number one county school system to lose students this current fiscal year was Shelby County. And another one that lost children was Davidson. So I think they're all coming here. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, so we stand to, and remember like what Mr. Spurlock talked about earlier, what comes in in 23-24 fiscal year, TISA, where we will see additional revenue. And that's why the more we discuss this and we talk with our board, with the fund balance that we have, this is a great opportunity, and with TIS on the rise, and this is a great opportunity for us to be able to tackle some of those capital projects and a possibility to continue to that each year. And with $20 million, close to $20 million a year, we could really catch up with some of those critical infrastructure needs that, that are going to fail anyway, pay cash for it. Could, could I ask a question? Yes, please. Doug, what, what is the minimum uh, requirement on fund balance for us? It's a 3%, and we've discussed, I mean, this has been discussed before, it's a good, good point, is when they put that 3% minimum, um, that's 65 million. That sounds like a lot of money until you look at the size of our budget. That's, if that would fund us less than two months of operating expenses. So that 3%, it is, they were thinking of the rural counties. Right. But as far as meeting that test, we meet it with this budget. You have before you on the next page, we have on the next page, the next two pages, we have the 182 growth positions that we discussed in detail with this committee in its April meeting. There's not been a single change for these 182 growth positions since we met with Health and Ed last month. That has remained the same. But does anyone have any question on these budget improvements on this summary, the next two pages here with the growth positions or anything there. Once again, this is the same thing we discussed last month. How many students, do you have any handle on how many students you expect coming into the system thus far? We probably hit 50,000 enrollment. In this budget, it's 50,000 mm -hmm. that we're anticipating for like supplies, instruction I, material. I know, how, how many? Increase. How many additional? About 1,000. I would anticipate 1,000. We got 2,000 this year, but I think a lot of it was for the coming back, you know, and moving in. So you expect that to kind of level off to pre-pandemic? Well, let's hope it levels off. You know. <laughs> if it well, doesn't, we got problems. <laughs> Somebody does, anyway. You know, the building hasn't stopped. Uh, it hasn't. There's a lot. Uh, Smyrna opened a new park here a year or so ago, about a little over a year ago, right above the Stewart's Creek Schools. Uh, my wife and I walk up there every day. It is packed. This is not, it's got a lot of adults, but there are a lot of kids there. There's a lot of children there. Uh, not only playing sports, but playing on the playground, uh, younger during the week. If the weather's nice, uh, there may be 20 or 30 kids and parents there with them playing on the playground. It's a nice playground. Uh, uh, well made, well safe. What that tells me is there's kids in waiting. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they may not be quite the age to hit the school system yet, they give them another year or so, and I'm sure their siblings are already there. Uh, so I'm, I'm just making what this old man's eyes are seeing out there, uh, and I'm sure it's happening in other parts of the county. It's not isolated to, to Smyrna and Stewart's Creek area immediately. Uh, so I, you, you may be low on that. Uh, I think... Uh, 
we're going to, uh, you know, barring a major recession within the next few months, I think we'll see, I'm, I'm just going to go out on the limb and say 1,400 students. Uh, so we'll, we'll find out, Could be. Mr. Bodery. Uh, at least, maybe more. But, uh, you know, th things are growing. Uh, a lot of things are good, not all of it. But uh, traffic, the traffic, I wish I had a set of spike strips. Uh, the, uh, you know, those, uh, my neighbor catches some of them, but uh, there are a lot of 70 and 80 mile an hour down through there, even though the uh, school zone signs are there. And, uh, you know, that's part of it. But we're, we're going to see the growth. Uh, it's continuing. Uh, we've got, what, three editions underway right now. Those will probably be full. Uh, so we'll talk about, I think, later in the year. We are, if it didn't come about by that, before we leave this uh uh, commission and uh, the new commissioners coming in in the fall will be talking about uh, more additions. I have strongly supported, you know, the, I'm, I've always been a strong supporter of education. Uh, my parents taught school. My grandfather was chairman of the school board over in Wilson County for many, many years. Uh, I, but I'm also, a, that's not the only thing. As we saw today in a town, we need, we need our school resource officers there. We need to be able to pay them. So schools are not the only thing. It takes, it takes uh, the community, it takes everybody working together. Uh, so we've got to fund those people too. Uh, I don't want to go back to and I don't want to go back to one school resource officer for two elementary schools. And we could be there if we don't pay these people. Uh, or maybe three elementary schools. And, and that's not what you need. You need people there on the, on the ground. Uh, so, yes, it's kind of hard for me to digest. But, uh, you know, we've, once again, we've got to do what we've got to do. And I think you presented some good things. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I think, getting a good handle on these school buildings because, you know, it's hard to believe. Twitch Creek Elementary and Middle opened in 06. Mm -hmm. 06. You can do the math. They're not young schools anymore. High school opened in 13. It's approaching, it's going to be 10 years old next year. Wear and tear uh, and everything. We've, you know, it just really doesn't make sense to go out here and build something and then not maintain it. It doesn't make sense to put our kids in the school building housing and a facility if we don't have people to care for them to nurture them to teach them that's the primary job of the school is to teach the children how to read write and do arithmetic the basic skills i read something today that it was about higher intellectual stuff and so on but Reading is essential to everything, and that's kind of pointed out in the <laughs> TISA thing, to bring the literacy rate up mm. at the third grade level to where the third graders are reading on the third grade level and not on the first or kindergarten level. So that's admirable uh, that the legislature's put that in there. And we've got to do our part in following through. So uh, it's a hard job uh, for the school board. Uh, be some new members there too uh, here in a few months like there'll be new members here so Mr. Bodery I really appreciate you uh, you have 
come in with uh, a really good layout of stuff, how it is so that we don't have to spend, you know, the first year or two I was on health and ed, we spent, oh, what time will we be getting out? 10, 11 o'clock tonight? Uh, you're trying to go through everything and, and so on. You've got it all lined out here for us. We either like it or we don't like it or we propose adjustments to it. So thank you. Problem. So Mr. Bedford, before you continue, um, so th this entire body has received a copy of the budget well in advance of tonight's meeting. Um, Mr. Rotary went over line item by line item, any budget explanations, um, if there were any large variations in any, um, any amounts. Um, he explained all the growth positions and um, each one of us had an opportunity to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with central office if we had any questions, any specific questions about the budget. So having said that and given his um, explanation, is there any further information that you need from Mr. Bodery or are we prepared for a motion? Mr. Phillips. Well, how many pages are here? 65. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how many numbers one through zero are on here, yeah. but millions, maybe billions, I don't know. Uh, but I keep circling this budget, budget deficit of uh, 28.8 million bucks. Uh, and that's kind of where we left it. Is there any discussion or any consideration as to where that deficit is going to be made up? Is that appropriate for us or does that go to the budget committee? Or is, is there a, a suggestion that you guys have at this particular point in time? I, I it's my understanding, Mr. Bader, I'll jump in. It's my understanding that this is coming out of fund balance and that we are confident based on um, his conferring with Ms. Nolan that this fund balance is going to be solid and will also come in end of year better than what, as it appears now. This is a worst case funding. It still leaves our fund balance at over 7%. Let me just kind of follow up on that, and and I'm a, a big fan of using funds. Commissioner Phillips, we you hold your microphone a little closer? We're having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. Thank okay. you. I'm, I'm a big fan of using funds uh, to, to reduce taxes and those types of things, but this $28.8 million, most of that, I don't know how much of it, but most of that is is reoccurring expenses correct majority of it is yes that's in uh, his labor and our ending fund balance is non reoccurring correct. revenue so what does that do for us next year great question i've always had this fear this suspicion that if we're using non reoccurring money to pay for reoccurring expenses, then at some point in time, we're kicking the can down the road and somebody's going to have to pay huge amounts uh, to, to make up that deficit. So my concern and question is, is wh what are we actually doing for us next year, a year before, and the year after, and the year after? The goal, the hope, is that the state, and like I said, we've been, we've been asking them for years, if the state makes good on TISA, with that additional funding, then we could see that deficit, that budget deficit go away. And if it doesn't, that money that we're talking, we're, we're, we're asking for to be moved, which is equivalent, you know, it, it's um, over close to a million dollars. Of course, it'll be less if we go over about 8.5. The commission can always bring that back if there was a shortfall and if the state reneged on their promise. You know, say that again. Them. I'm not sure I understood what you just said, Doug. All right. If the hope is the our not it's not even our hope. It's it's our plan. The plan is we've always had budgeted deficits for years simply because the BEP is inadequate. You know this this county commission has been a great partner with local funds. The state has been woefully inadequate for years with their state BEP. We we keep going back to nurses school nurses, 15 nurses fund, fit positions funded for the entire school system of Rutherford County with 50 schools. I mean, that's 
that's just so woefully inadequate of funding. That will change with TISA to bring that down to, what is it, Ms. Furlock? The one, one to 750, so we'll actually pick up an, an additional 15.2, I think is the way it works, so, that will be funded. You know, one of the things over the last several years, we've had a, a deficit. One, of, I, we can go back to 2019. I, I want to say that somewhere in our ending fund balance, it was a maybe a little less than 6% ending fund balance. Out of it, mm -hmm. as in 19, yeah. and we did that. To, to summarize what you're saying, answer the question. We are spending on reoccurring revenue on the expenses, but that expenses next year would be covered under a new BEP formula, and we will not have to kick that can down the road because of that. That is correct. It actually may give some, not only if the, if the state makes good on that funding, there's a, and I'm speaking with Ms. Nolan about this, it's like, it's, um, there, there may even be opportunity to address some of the educational debt service needs, not with the state money, but with some local money that's already been earmarked for education. So this is a huge opportunity for Rutherford County. You know, one of the things that the commission has done, and quite frankly, it's not everywhere you have this, is you've paid outside the BEP. Out, you know, you've paid for positions that we needed that were outside of the BP. And, and that's the reason why with this uh, moratorium of, of holding the, B, uh, the local maintenance of effort for the next four years, that's probably, uh, not probably, with the kind of growth that we have, that's, that's gonna provide you guys some latitude to do some things uh, to, to, to either address us or whatever. So I think it, I, you, when you see that, that's really going to uh, be good for, for going forward. And there's also one other measurement tool that we typically look at every year, and it's one of the handouts that um, Mr. Spraylock gave you, and that is our per pupil expenditure in comparison with all the other counties. And so on, this is about five pages long, Rutherford County per student, we're deep into page three, spending $9,229.21 per student. Um, and I don't have on here what the average, what the state average is, I just have what the other counties are. 11.5. 11.5 is the state average. So um, I only point out that to say we do try very hard to cover all these recurring expenses. Just the expenses go up because the enrollment's going up. It's just kind of a chasing your tail sort of thing where it, it's just a cycle we're in. Fortunately, with good financial managers, it's worked out successfully in the past. We have to trust that with future commissions, that'll be the same. It kind of, be kind of interesting to know, instead of the per pupil expenditures, what the per county budgets are, and see where we fit in that particular category. We may be way down on what we're spending, but overall, per pupil, but overall, how are we spending that money compared to some other counties? I would assume that we would be. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's all that in. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think you're right. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Mayor, you had a comment? If you want the expenditure, you can multiply the pupils by the per pupil expenditure and come up with a. I think you were saying the overall county budget, yeah, the I think total he's county budget. About what percent of the, of the county? Okay. Budget. Ms. Sharp, use your microphone, please. Also, the last numbers that I looked at at Davidson County and Shelby County were 12 and 15,000 per student. And yeah, they're on here. Davidson County is $12,374. Shelby is 11167 Mayor, you had a comment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I'll just say back in January, there was a lot of consternation with our legislative delegation 
uh, because they really didn't understand TISA and what it was going to do for us. But uh, I think we owe them a lot of gratitude for sticking with this because what's always happened, if you go back down that chart back to the, back to the early 90s, is that uh, there are more votes in your rural counties who vote against the larger counties who have the growth, and this system seemed to work. And so our delegation finally saw that, and they were united in the front and saw that this is going to bring us huge amounts of, of um, needed cash to run the fastest growing system in the state. So hats off to our, our legislative delegation. Any other questions or comments from budget, BOE? Anybody have anything they'd like to add? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Read the motion for us, Mr. Bodry. Ma'am. Motion is general purpose school fund fiscal year 22-23 budget has an estimated $462,670,815 in revenues, $491,473,674 in expenditures, and uses 36 million uh, no, that's wrong. I'm sorry. That's all right, Doug. Yeah. It's a title <laughs> it uses, I apologize. Let me pull that up. It uses $28,802,859 in fund balance. which is budgeted is a budgeted deficit of less than 6% of total budgeted expenditures. This proposed expenditure budget provides funding for a 5% pay increase for all RCS certified and classified employees, a 3% increase for RCS bus contractors, as well as an additional or an, I'm sorry, the addition of 182 FTE positions needed to provide educational services in the fastest growing LEA in the state of Tennessee. Recommended motion to approve the 2223 general purpose school Fund 141, budget as presented. <coughs> Move to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Will you give us a roll call, please? Commissioner Phillips? Yes. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Key? Yes. Commissioner Gurley? Yes. Chairman Allen? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Before you leave, could you just answer one, uh, I don't know if I need, need this question to be answered, but you, you mentioned the insurance, the uh, school system is going over, the school board and school system is going over to the state plan, and there's, a, there's a revenues that are flat projected for this year, but in all probability it would cost less, and if it ends up costing less, what would happen to those additional funds? The funds, of course, I'm budgeting, just I'm holding the line. The only increase I did for for medical lines was just for growth positions, the 182. I allocated for that for additional funding. That, the savings in the current fiscal year would stay there in the general purpose school fund and roll to fund balance. So if we had savings, it would decrease that budgeted deficit. But once again, I did not want to do that until I saw our initial enrollment phase with that new new those new plans I have two announcements for this committee first of all let's welcome the new um, superintendent of schools um, dr. Sullivan thank you so much for being here welcome And then as per our usual custom, because the commission meets twice in June, we typically have to move the Health and Education Committee meeting. And so our next meeting will be June 21st. It's one week early. <coughs> Make sure you've made a note of that on your calendar, please. Anything else for us? No. Yep. Commissioner P? Well, you haven't voted on your budget yet, so I've got a question. I thought we did. Did you? Yeah, you, we did. All right, good. I wanted to ask about these five additions that we have been talking about and what I'd like to see is some kind of funding mechanism forwarded to budget so we can take care of this before the end of this fiscal year. I'll work with Ms. I'd, Nolan. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that and, and maybe uh, have uh, Trey, if he could come back up and kind of go through 
the most current timeline that we have. Uh, and I'm really interested in that additional 20 million bucks. Is that in the back of your mind, as it is in the back of my mind, that could be used uh, for, for those particular projects? Or the, and you're looking at the debt payment for, and I'm going to clarify, for the high, these high school additions that has been discussed. Correct. You will have a four-year window there. Please go to the microphone. I mean, Thank you. There will be a four-year window there with the same amount of money that he's just referenced. Under TISA, like the maintenance of effort that we currently have for local funding will stay, will stay the same. So I'm going to be discussing with Ms. Nolan. Once TISA comes in, we'll have that four-year window where, and it's because of the rural counties that was the fear that they, they, they couldn't meet maintenance of effort even because they, basically because they're losing students, um, the majority of them. The, what this will allow is we cannot drop local funding currently going to the GP fund. But when, like with Ms. Olin, you know, she, she coordinates with me each year and it's like, hey, sales tax came in better this year than we budgeted. Instead of just saying, we're gonna do an amendment to increase that in the GP fund, which increases MOE, we could then look at saying, we can move some of that to fund debt for those schools in the debt service fund. Robert, was the, the answer to your question as it relates, can we do something now? Uh, well, that's, that, that's my question. Maybe you need to sit down with Lisa and we'll discuss that mm -hmm. more. But what I'm telling you and what many of the commissioners are interested in is at least getting the first three funded now for this coming year, not waiting and going ahead and getting this in place before these current commissioners leave office. Gotcha. It was definitely a misnomer question with the debt. One of the reasons for that is, as, as you guys know, we've worked together for a number of years, and we, this committee, and maybe even me in particular, are brought up, I won't vote for any more projects until the infrastructure is included in that. We've advanced along those lines. and. I also want to make sure that when we build schools that we build them big enough to where we don't have to build them three miles apart. Uh, and, and I think we've accomplished some of those things, but expanding these schools is high on my priority list. And that's one project that I'd like to see come to fruition before my term ends this year, if at all possible. So I, I, I'd, I'd like to, see if there's a way we can accomplish that. And I'm going to go ahead and reemphasize uh, before uh, Commissioner Gurley gets the microphone and goes on and on and on and on again. Uh, uh, I'd like to reemphasize that uh, the Oakland project is not only near and dear to me, but I think it's absolutely imperative that it be included in the early stages simply because of what's happening nationwide within the last few days, especially today, and the security issues that Oakland High School has, we absolutely positively must correct that situation. It should be one of the most important things that we do is secure the safety of our kids that go to that school. You heard what happened in Texas this afternoon. Uh, I could see that happening at one of our older schools extremely important to me, to this commissioner, that, that we correct that situation. And with the expansion of those high schools, it would at least correct Oakland. So thank you. Commissioner Gurley. Well, Commissioner Phillips and I have known each other for a long time since Smyrna High School, and we respect each other, but I, I have to I, I, would, I wish right now we could fund all five additions right now, tonight. Uh, I don't know where the money's coming from, and number one, I don't know what they're going to cost. Uh, I say, I'm going to go b build me a house. I'm going to build a house next, I got the property. I'm going to build a house next door to the one I've got. I have no idea what it's going to cost. 
I'm just going to build a house. I don't know. Is it going to cost 300000 400000 500000 What's the interest rates going to be? What's the material cost going to be? We don't know any of that right now. So I, th I don't think it's good on our part necessarily to try to fund something that we don't know what's going to cost. But on the security issue, as I've said before, I I've, I've been to bomb threats. I've been to possible active shooter at Oakland High School uh, as a responder. If we have a major security issue at these high schools, w w then I'll put this back to the board, current and future. They need to be looking at what they need to do as a separate project, aside from expanding pupil capacity at those schools to ensure that those schools are safe. Because new or old, it can happen anywhere. It could happen anywhere. And the security issues to keep that from happening are well beyond building a building. There are things that can be incorporated in the building that can help, but just the building, increasing the capacity of the building itself is not going to solve your security issues. And so I challenge, if there is a security issue at Oakland, Riverdale, whatever, school, then the, the board should be taking that up as a separate project, either through your internal security director or hire an outside consultant to do a thorough analysis of that, the security of that facility and come back with recommendations. So, I, I, like I said, Commissioner Phillips and I re highly regard each other, but I have to disagree with him on this. All right, I'll let you two continue that conversation after the meeting. Is there any other business for this committee? If not, we stand adjourned. Thank you.